All right. So again, thank you for joining us. We have two great papers that these guys are going to discuss um, tonight. As a reminder, you can ask questions through the question, the Q&A box um, on Zoom, um, or you can use the chat. I will be monitoring both. Sometimes the question one is a little bit easier for us to keep an eye on versus the chat. Uh, but if you do have something that you'd like to ask, we'll do our best to get to all those questions. We may hold them towards the end um, just to keep the flow going, but we'll try and keep um, all of those in mind and certainly can answer them offline later if they are pressing. Just a quick thank you to all of our sponsors that make the journal possible and make events like this possible. Um, we have a lot of fantastic sponsors, so check them out on our website and visit their pages. Um, we wouldn't be able to do this without them and especially uh, Northeast Seminars who partners with us on this particular project with the Journal Club. Um, last little thing is we did extend the deadline for our annual research forum at OSET this year. So abstracts can come in all the way through August 7th. Um, so through this weekend, if you're interested in that, all of that information is available on IJSPT.org. And lastly, registration is still open for the World Congress. So um, that covers that little piece of it. Um, last thing is, those of you that attended last time, we are giving, um, have the ability to give um, CEU credit for the journal clubs. If you are attending live, you do need to attend the majority of the journal club. It's about an hour long. As long as you attend greater than about 35 minutes of it, you will get your certificate sent to you. So we have approval in the state of Tennessee and Louisiana, as well as BOC approval. So just want to make sure everyone knows about that. So stay on for the full webinar so you can make sure to get your credit. And without further ado, I'm going to mute myself um, and hide myself, although I am not Mike Voigt. Um, <laughs> we'll see his picture here for a minute, and I'm going to turn it over to Rob. Great. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, thank you, International Journal of Sports Physical Therapy and Northeast Seminars again for uh, allowing us to host this second uh, journal club. Uh, we have two uh, great articles, I think, from, I believe these are from the last issue, to be honest. Um, the first article is effectiveness of scapular stabilization versus non-stabilization stretching on shoulder range of motion, a randomized controlled clinical trial by Alan Howell et al. And part of et al. is one of our uh, guests here tonight, Tim Uhl. And uh, I'll let Tim introduce himself in a moment. And then the second article is can the scapular dyskinesis test be associated with throwing related injuries during the course of a collegiate baseball season by uh, Massa Tsuruki? Uh, I believe, and um, Todd Ellenbecker uh, helped Massa with that study, and we're going to talk about it uh, a little bit later in the second half of the Journal Club. Uh, but before we start, <coughs> excuse me, I'd like to introduce our, uh, well, my co-host Phil Page is not on yet. He'll be on uh, shortly, hopefully, uh, but our guest host for tonight is uh, a great physical therapist who a lot of us know from the Cleveland Clinic, Gary Calabri. So, uh, I'll start off, first of all, I guess, Gary, do you mind uh, telling uh, everybody about yourself just briefly so sure, people can sure. know, you know where you're at, what you do, uh, how long you've been doing it? Just give us a little brief bio, if you don't mind. Yeah, great. Welcome, everybody. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, my name is Gary Kelbys. I'm also not Mike Voigt. Uh, I, uh, I'm at the Cleveland Clinic at Sports Medicine. I've been uh, practicing for uh, almost 40 years. Uh, my practice has mainly been focused on the overhead athlete uh, over, over those years, as well as uh, obviously uh, basketball related injuries. I am on the medical team for the uh, NBA Cleveland Cavaliers. So I'm uh, ecstatic to be here and look forward to a great discussion tonight about two great articles. And I'm glad Tim's here. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Uh, so our next, I guess we have two Tims now. Uh, we actually have uh, the the real Tim Ool, and then it looks like a fake Tim Ool, which uh, <laughs> I guess I don't think I've met Alan. But is that is this Alan? This, this is Alan. Us? Hey, Alan, how are you? Uh, I'll have Good. you introduce yourself in just a minute. So first of all, uh, everybody, please say hello to Tim Ool. Tim, would you mind uh, giving everybody just a quick little rundown of who you are, what you do, et cetera? Sure. Thanks. I want to thank IJSPT and. Um, Northeast Seminars for inviting us to come and uh, chat. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of Kentucky in the Department of Physical Therapy. I've been at the University of Kentucky in the um, athletic training and in the physical therapy uh, side of things since 1999. Uh, I was a clinician for 15 years and then uh, went back to school at the University of Virginia and got my PhD and 
um, helped start the first athletic training program, post-professional athletic training program at UK. And But I've always been dual credentialed. I've worked uh, in sports medicine clinics down in Lexington, Kentucky with Ben Kibler, down in Columbus, Georgia with Tab Blackburn, <coughs> and uh, a lot of other uh, great folks in Michigan and Virginia with my academic. So it's been really great to get to work with so many great clinicians like Alan and Gary over the years and Rob uh, to sort of help and, and help do some research. It's nice when we can tie the two concepts together. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. I agree with you 100%. Alan, uh, do you mind just introducing yourself quickly? Sure. Uh, my name is Alan Howell. I'm a uh, PT, uh, AT, as well as an uh, SCS for uh, certified for sports medicine. Um, I have been doing this for uh, 43 plus years, um, wow. have been uh, involved in sports my whole career uh, as an athlete, as well as uh, as a uh, PT, uh, actually blowing out my knee as a senior in high school got me to go into PT. Uh, so that was an interesting uh, uh, way to get into it. But anyway, uh, long story short, I've been uh, working in private PT clinics, uh, mainly uh, sports medicine, and then now most recently more into uh, doing more balance and, and those kind of things. Uh, I have had experience with, and part of my article is uh, part of my experience with uh, U.S. swimming and uh, shoulders uh, with swimmers uh, and what I uh, surmised after working with them for a great number of years. I was an Olympic trainer in 92 for U.S. swimming and water polo and 96 uh, uh, trainer for the uh, field hockey venue in, in Atlanta. Wow. Well, that, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of experience. We appreciate you uh, being joining with us tonight uh, and uh, helping us when, as we talk about this study. And then last but not least, the man that uh, needs no IJSPT introduction, the man who showed up late, Phil, Dr. Phil Page. That's Phil, do you want to you, you want to tell everybody quickly about you again? I know good, that you... good evening. Sorry for being late. We just finished up with a board meeting here. <laughs> um, my name is Phil Page. I am an editor with the with the journal. Been with it uh, for quite a number of years. I'm a associate professor and director of research at Franciscan University, a small DPT program here in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Just uh, just glad to chew the fat on research. You know, this is the stuff we really geek out on. So I'm real happy to be here. Thanks. It always makes it a fun time, doesn't it, Phil? Yeah, just, sure does. just getting the, like, I saw, like I was telling uh, Tim uh, earlier, this is really, we just want this to be just kind of like we're oh, hanging yeah, out after the meeting, good. having a beer, talking about the studies, yep. man, just like geeking out. So yep. Tim or Alan, let's start off with your study. Do you guys uh, do either one of you, uh, it doesn't matter who, to be honest, do you, do you mind giving us just like the five minute synopsis of your study? And then we'll start talking about it in maybe more detail. Yeah, I'll go on. Um, so Alan was at one of our meetings in Lexington and approached me at the bar after the lectures <laughs> that's, at the that's end where of the day. all the good stuff starts, isn't it? It's yeah, always yeah. starts all, all the good stuff and on uh, napkins usually. Yes, um, exactly. So so he talked to me about stretching. I had done a presentation on some muscle injuries. And as many of you know, Dr. Kibler used to put on a big sports medicine meeting down here in Lexington. So Alan lives in Cincinnati. So he approached me. He asked me, you know, I really do a lot of scapular stabilization when I stretch with my swimmer. So I get a good glenohumeral mobility, but you didn't really talk about that. And I said, well, we do that. We do different components. And he had invited me up to his clinic. So it was really a clinic driven research project because of my science background and PhD. I was able to go up and meet with him and we designed a study. Uh, he gave a little uh, he didn't do exactly what he normally did, but it actually probably had a big effect. He normally is safe and very judicious as increasing um, range of motion. He'll start with one plane, but for the limited amount of time, we only had three treatment visits. I convinced him to do all three planes. So we did horizontal adduction, rotation, and flexion. And because he I asked him, we're just going to do stretching. 
He's like, well, I can't carry that out for very long. So we only did three visits. That's why it's a really tight, short study. And it really addresses the issue that a lot of people have talked about, where you want to establish motion first before you do a bunch of other stuff. And a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of good research, but what you see a lot of times is they throw stretching, scapular stabilization, TheraBand, resistive exercises. So what was the real effect? And this is one of those few studies where we just looked at stretching's immediate effects. No other intervention was added other than his standard heat before and ice after with some electrical stimulation. Electrical stim before too, yeah. 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 And so he uh, he was really compliant because he gave up control of his patients to try to do that study. So I really appreciate his. There aren't many clinicians that are willing to randomize patients into one of two interventions. So that was the that was the premise of the study. And then depending on where you want to go, but that that's how we got started. Any anything else you would add, Alan? No, not really. You had my arm twisted behind my back. So that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> and science happens that way sometimes. Yeah, I hear you. So Gary or Phil, do you guys have any uh, questions before we start or uh, would you want me to jump in or? I'll start real quick, Gary. I beat you to the unmute because, <laughs> and, and we thought, I mean, I love the study. You guys did a great, it was real, like you said, Tim, it was really tight and uh, I like the the methodology it was very rigorous in science. I did my question was why did we do East End before the stretching on everybody? I had the same question. I had the, I had the same <laughs> I, that, that was on my I'm list. I, I am really yeah. curious because I teach modalities. I'm really interested to know why we did that. I will let Alan answer that because that's part of his routine. Okay. I mean, we use East End mainly for uh, on this type of East End being the uh, high volts. Mm -hmm. We use that that type for uh, basically getting down inflammation, as well as uh, making sure that we're helping to uh, desensitize the area and, and relieve some, you know, get an analgesic effect. And that's really what what we were using it for. It's just something when Tim and I talked about it, I said this is something we would traditionally, when someone comes in with shoulder pain, we would use East Stem and then go ahead and start them with their stretching program. You and he said, well, we can do that as long as we do it on all of them. Right. That was the key is that we, yeah, you have to. That was not a, a, a factor because we did it on both groups, whether they did the stabilized scapula stretching or the non stabilized scapula stretching. It was, it was I sort was of say, kudos watch. for adding modalities to a study. Good job. Yeah. That's, that's real good old school of you. I appreciate that. Alan, do you remember? Do you remember? I, it, I, for some reason, I think the uh, the article said that the pain was like at a two to three out of ten. Was that the average pain yes. was two to three? So there were some people that were higher. Some were so, fours so, and fives. Okay. And I, I was, that's another question I had: is if they, if they had a, like a two out of ten, if everyone had a two out of ten pain, did you really even need to do it? But if that was the average and some of them were higher, then obviously you'd right. want to use it, and it just brought the the number down to the mean. Well, we wanted more people in the study, and it took us two years to get the limited number we had. You know, a good way to get rid of ankle sprains is start studying ankles. Exactly. Sprains. That's what we're going to do this year at Isn't UK, that see yeah. if that helps <laughs> our basketball true. team. Um, but um, so as soon as Alan and I started the study, oh, I got all these shoulder patients, all this, and then it dries up. Never fails. And so, so the, the reality, the unfortunately, with that was we wanted more. We didn't need a ton. So our power, we were a little underpowered, but the effect was so phenomenal that we went on and decided to run it up and see if a journal would accept it. And we had submitted that to CSM a year or so prior. Yeah. Good. You know, so what I found interesting is really most of the literature that came out, uh, Tim and Tim and, and Alan really looks at asymptomatic uh, individuals and, and study uh, the overhead athlete, uh, do mass screenings and mass measurements. And there's really very few studies that, that really look at symptomatic uh, individuals. Even though the pain level was really relatively low, uh, I, I, think that, I think that part of the, uh, and one of my questions was, uh, you know, did you look at any of the 
uh, pain mitigating related postural, thoracic spine, pec minor tightness? Were there any other treatment uh, interjections that, that, and I know you have to be tight on a study, but uh, you know, that, that potentially would have affected a greater decrease in pain. We, we did not. I think that if it, if it was a normal clinical environment, he probably would have done more things. But because we had agreed to do the study, I, as he said, I had his uh, hands behind his back so we could control that. Um, and we asked for average current pain. I think if we had asked a different question, like your worst pain in the last seven days, we yeah, probably yeah. would have had a higher level. So I think the context in which we asked the pain probably diminished the number that I think they probably had a little bit more pain doing normal activities, but because the way we asked the question um, might have diminished that. And I think that's an important point, you know, when you do that. Your point about all the other studies, that was a big selling point is yeah. McClure done a really nice study on people with tight shoulders and Cools has done a study. I think only Tim Tyler was the only other study that we saw and he did everything. It was mass combined right. um, on a real pathological patient population. I mean, yeah, it's really been, aren't that many. Yeah, there they're, many they're, they're on there. throwing athletes who often right. have these tightnesses, but not necessarily what we would see walking into the clinic. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Gary. Uh, you know, I'd like to I'd like to understand more of the thought process about the patient positioning. You know, having a supine position uh, for uh, tissue stretching when really most of the studies have been done on a on a a sideline, a sideline assisted. Uh, you, you know, you did them in all the supine position. Was that for ease of people completing their home exercise program, or are you on to are you on to something here? Well. I think that the key is the this, this supine position allows you to stabilize the scapula with body weight, holding it down to begin with. And then when you throw in having your uh, palm and thinner eminence holding down the uh, border of the scapula, now you have not only your hand, but you have your body weight holding the scapula in one position. Now you can do strictly glenohumeral motion without having the scapula move. Um, this this kind of came to me way back when I was working with a lot of swimmers and watching how they they had unbelievable range of motion, but I, I saw their their scapula basically and pardon the, the verbiage, but swim all over their back. It wasn't stabilized at all. And so when we stabilized it, we saw the difference in their actual mobility of the glenohumeral joint, and that's where some of the impingements, some of the other rotator cuff issues that we were seeing with swimmers. As we started blocking their motion, both horizontal adduction as well as forward flexion, it allowed us to then, uh, you know, stabilize their scapula easier as opposed to in a sideline position. Now I've got to go ahead and hold their shoulder blade and also their body. Well, that wasn't that wasn't the answer I thought I was going to hear. I, I thought it I thought it would be because of uh, compressing the the tissue, the posterior tissue, and maybe give it a relaxation inhibition. Uh, but you know, I'm not I'm I don't deal with a lot of swimmers, so you know, I I, I get the maximum uh, compression on the on the bony eminence, obviously, of the scapula. I was wondering about the effect on you know, does it have an effect on uh, tissue compression? which should be an inhibitor to contraction, which theoretically should allow the tissue to be more extensible. Very long that, more, yeah. Yeah. That so was Gary, great. so that brings up a point, Gary. So how do you do your uh, stretching when you're doing posterior shoulder stretching? How do you do it? Do you do it sideline? Like so I describing? do a modified, yeah, I'll do. So when they're, so is that for them to do their home program or while you're, you're, you're personally doing your stretching of them? Yeah, so so my approach to to the shoulder and, and scapula really is dependent on injured athlete, uninjured athlete. So preventative versus injured, and my sequence on an on a non-injured athlete. So someone I'm trying to prevent uh, arm arm issues with. 
I'll use a non-stabilized scapula, uh, move to a partially stabilized, so the modified, and then a completely stabilized scapula. So I go through three sequence in the same treatment. So it, it, is, a, it is a combination of uh, getting the load response to the tissue in all environments. Now that's for the non-injured. For the injured, I reverse that order and I stabilize it first because I'm, I'm concerned most about pain mitigation, making sure that the, the scapula, the posterior, the infraspinatus, superior and inferior, you know, those are, those are getting extensible and, and then I'll move to a partial and then finally to the non-stabilized. So that's my approach. There's no science behind it, Tim. I need you to study this for me. Uh, <laughs> so. It's a longer drive up to Cleveland. <clears throat> it is. Uh, maybe Just I can jump bit. on one of those Cavalier jets. There you um, go. But um, I, I do, I do want to bring a point up, and I think Phil and and you guys might appreciate this is that during the home exercise, they were non-stabilized because there was no way for us to teach it. Alan told me he often will have a spouse teach him to do that, but for consistency with the research. But when you look at the data and you look at the post one to the pre two or the post two to the pre three, they get better with good old fashioned unstabilized stretching in between treatments. Now these are only two or three or four days. It's not a very long time window but even though we're not stabilizing, so I think it actually provides some support to what you're saying, Gary, because we did very stabilized and non-stabilized in that yeah. group, and there was a big jump in mobility. And I think the other thing that Alan was really fearful of is that we did sort of superior capsule with internal rotation. We sort of got the inferior part of the soft tissue. I don't think it's just capsule. And then more the infraspinatus teres with horizontal, but doing all three planes at once. So we ended up doing 30 repetitions, 10 in horizontal, 10 in internal rotation, and 10 in flexion, really was something that, prop. I mean, I'm theorizing, but one of the reasons why we got such a huge increase on day one or in that group might've been because we did so much pain-free, so maybe there was some elastic changes or, or I, I don't know that they're true changes permanently, but so many repetitions of that pain-free stretching really was impressive, and then they stuck with it in the non-treatment days, yeah, home unstabilized. Program, yeah. So we sort of did your study, not in three phases, but in two. But in two. Well, we got a question from uh, anonymous, an anonymous attendee. Uh, no surprise that stabilizing one segment during stretching would result in greater range of motion, but that group didn't realize a meaningful decrease in pain or function. So as a profession, do we overvalue range of motion improvement when we're assessing outcomes? So I think we saw improvements in pain, but it wasn't statistically significant because they were so low. The goal of stretching is to gain mobility. It's not just to decrease pain like Gary talked about before. There's some other manipulations or techniques. Um, it's, an, it's a primary impairment. We certainly have good data that it's an injury prevention. I really think there's, there's a, a couple of nice algorithms and some good evidence that if you go after strength too early, you're probably not going to have good function. So I, I think it is an important shoulder mobility issue to address early on. Yeah, I do too. I, I mean, don't want to really... just chase pain either. No. Because no. that can be very subjective and have central sensitization issues and other issues. So at least it's a very objective, reliable measurement that if we, and everybody had impairments, in both groups when we started. So that would certainly be something to go after. Yeah, I agree. Do you, Phil, uh, Phil and uh, Gary, do you guys, but, uh, what Tim's talking about where someone's got uh, maybe more pain than these people were describing, but you're seeing a shoulder patient, they've got a limitation of motion, they got a limitation of strength. 
uh, but they've got increased pain. Do you do you agree with him that really? Because I I do I I usually go with the approach of starting to get range of motion back before I start a lot of strengthening exercises. Do you guys agree with that, or do you think you just jump in with strengthening and range of motion at the same time? I, go ahead. I, I I mean I totally agree with you. I feel that if you've got a motion deficit, if you start strength too early, it's going to be very difficult to get that motion. Your posterior rotator cuff, if you're doing scapular stabilization and, uh, you know, scapular retractions and rows and all kinds of posterior rotator cuff stuff, you're not going to get that mobility back as quick as you'd like. I mean, eventually you probably could get it, but I think early on, if you get the motion, now as long as you are not losing any of your motion as you're testing throughout and you're adding strength in there for scapular stabilization, I think that's your key. And if you and and so that's why this unfortunately this this didn't add any strength. It didn't add anything to it in this in this paper. But um, it's something that just to show that the how quickly you can get range of motion if you stay away from strength and then add in add it in. <clears throat> so, what do you think, Gary? Yeah. So so I don't think there's a clear line that we say okay. <clears throat> excuse me, we have adequate mobility, now we'll add strength. I think when we're, when we're looking at these kinds of tissue loads, you're looking at static loads and passive stretch loads, right? So active, static, holding a position, static uh, stretch loads, <clears throat> and then passive loads is obviously the, the assisted, uh, the scap stabilized. I think when you get the patient to the point where they can get into dynamic stretching, movement-based function stretching with agonist antagonist type of, of responses going on. That's kind of my sweet spot where I start to add some resistance. So I, do, I don't think it's a clear, I don't think there's a clear line where we can say they've reached, like you had a tremendous internal rotation gains, which for that age population, quite honestly, is, is expected because that's like starting an exercise program with a deconditioned person, right? At 55, your gains go through the roof for, for the first, you know, three to three to six weeks, and then they start leveling off. So what you showed, I believe is, is very important in that I'm not sure that pain at the levels that you were experiencing mattered. I think you're affecting the tissue. I would like to see the next phase with your patients, and I'm sure you do, have the dynamic flexibility and stretching and then start to add some resistance that that to me is kind of how everything overlaps in my mind Bill, I got some her. kind of stabilized internal external right gotcha phil i got a uh, research a uh, stats question for you here so uh, and well first of all i have to talk to tim ask tim and alan did you guys actually do your uh a priori reliability testing did, did you do reliability testing on Alan before? Okay. I thought you just, I didn't think you did it uh, on Alan. <coughs> Excuse me. I thought you just referenced stuff, but you didn't I, uh, do it. So I did it. Yeah. I, I saw okay. I came up there and we had lunch. And <coughs> I tortured a few of his uh, other physical therapy Perfect. Texts. So my question for my Phil favorite. then, my question for Phil then is how important is it that each researcher themselves <laughs> prove themselves reliable for what they're doing in their study versus just saying, you know, Paige et al., Mansky et al. found this uh, uh, test reliable. How important is it that the researcher themselves that are collecting yeah. the data find themselves reliable? Boy, that, this is why I loved the study that you guys did because it's kind of like I've got Andre Labe over here in the. Uh, I wonder who the hell was doing. What the hell was going on over there? I, I saw that little thing this, going on earlier. This is what I have to deal with. So can I do this and have fun while we do it? Right. What I loved about your study was it was a poster child for what I teach every day. In stop it now, you're done. In clinical. Um, research. This is a very pragmatic study. It's short term. Back to the, the question that you had earlier of, yeah, it's great to have a decrease in pain and increased range of motion in three visits. I'm not going to jump right in there and start measuring function in the third visit and say that it's done. I mean, you've got to get the pain. Pain is inhibitory. You got to get the pain down. 
That's why the east down was a great idea. This, the, the range of motion, and you saw this progression. So your question, I love that you asked that question, Rob, because that's a pet peeve of mine. I know it is of yours. Because <laughs> <too. laughs> because every study should should have that iterated reliability for the individuals in the study, not just cite something else. You can cite validity, but not the reliability per se. And that's a pet peeve of both you and I. But what I did want to give you guys kudos on was, again, Tim, this is one of the I, I preach to the kids every day that p-values aren't that important and you kind of exemplified that at the end here as I'm looking at your last statement and the results you have this confidence interval which is, includes zero and you say that the p is less is equal to 0.03 you don't say oh it's a significant difference what do you say it's not clinically meaningful that to me was like right here man that's the way to be <laughs> on research yeah the way that you guys approach this study by reporting confidence intervals, by reporting effect sizes, by reporting MCIDs, you're preaching to the choir. And I just wish that more papers were like this. And I wish that more clinicians would beg and understand what you guys did. So kudos to you. Thanks. That was very nice. And, and I preach the same thing. And, you know, teaching research to PT students is tough because some people just find new techniques, new statistics that just confuse the living daylight. Show me the means, show me the standard deviations, what's the measurement error, how do you know a patient got better? And, and it gets really confusing because you run all these other stats and they don't ever really answer the original question or a fundamental question. And, and sometimes I think simpler is much more clear and straightforward. I, being a clinician and then going back and getting my PhD like Phil did, mm -hmm. you see, I have friends, I have classmates, I'm working with a young lady right now who graduated the year after me down in Harlan, Kentucky, and not the best of weather down in eastern Kentucky yeah. recently. Um, she's got this really great approach to treating patients with substance abuse. I'm like, I, don't worry about it. Just talk about the simple thing. Don't look at all these sub analysis that she wants to do. Keep it simple. That's the take home point. And I think you, I agree 100% with you, Phil, that we get too complicated. And I really try to say, okay, we found a difference, but is it a real difference? Mm, probably not. Love, love it, love it, love it. And, and, and again, kudos. I did my Pedro analysis. I gave you a 10 out of 11. So wow, that's good. It's wow. a really, it's a really good Impressive. study, guys. Congratulations. Thank you. You know, Thank for you. the clinicians out there, you know, well, how, how we have to look at studies is is this going to change your practice? Okay, to me, this gives us a couple real key points that can change practice. One, let's say you have a let, let's say you have a flexion deficit. Probably doesn't matter if you're stabilized or unstabilized right? Let's say you have inferior capsule to infraspinatus, probably would be better to be stabilized. So it gives us true, real clinical information, and you are honest about it. And it wasn't, it, it wasn't, uh, it, you know, it wasn't manipulated in any way. And, and that's how I look at studies as a clinician, and, and not really a, a true researcher is, is this going to information going to change my practice? I'm going to try the supine, supine stretches, uh, uh, Alan, uh, <laughs> on, our, on our baseball players. There I think you go, you'll Gary. notice a big difference. We'll have to have you back, and you can uh, let us know on an on a, <laughs> uh, upcoming episode, Gary. All right. Does anybody have any more questions for uh, Tim and Alan before we move to there, our There was a chat question paper. or a Q&A question. I can't remember which one. Was there? Let me the, see here. They asked about why we didn't do the sleeper stretch versus the towel behind the back. Oh, okay. And, okay. and that was sort of a protocol that Alan typically does. If they have under a certain amount of shoulder flexion, was it 120? Is that right? Uh, yeah. Alan, something like that. He does behind the back controlled stretching and then works up the back. I think because we wanted to keep the non-stabilized, non-stabilized in our home exercise program, we kept it really simple. This is like, um, I don't remember if it was Phil or uh, Gary, you know, these are 40, 50 year old patients. So 
that's functional, right? The hand behind the back is a nice functional activity that some patients can't do or want to do. So I think that was the other reason. Is that pretty much it, Alan? Yeah, part of it, part of it was such that um, I found just over my career that the sleeper stretch can be actually a painful stretch, uh, especially when you're laying on, on that, you know, uh, elbow slash shoulder uh, that's actually blocking the whole shoulder motion. So it's something that, that I find can be somewhat painful. So I found that, you know, if someone can place their hand behind their back then we'll do the towel up the back. But we, have, we had some in the very beginning that they were using their wand or their stick just to get it to the starting point for internal rotation. So um, that's kind of how I, I looked at it, you know, over the years. Great. Well, thank you guys. Are you, are you both gonna hang out? Are you, Alan and uh, Tim, you're both gonna stay for the uh, second article too. You wanna just hang out with us and- Sure. Tim, sure, because okay. they, they quoted Tim's research, so he needs to stay. Yeah, on. he needs to stick in, stick in here for a little bit. Dr. All right, Taylor's so our second, research, yeah. our uh. second study. Uh, can the scapular dyskinesis test be associated with throwing related injuries during the course of a collegiate baseball season? Um, Phil, do you know how to? Do you by chance know how to pronounce these guys' names? I would, I, I can butcher them, but I, I would say Saruki. Um, Saruki. Yeah, Masaki, Masaki Saruki. Yohi uh, and Yohi Mukahara. Mukahara. Yeah. And then uh, what's actually, the last guy? You know the can you pronounce uh, the last guy? guy? He's some skinny guy out in Arizona. <laughs> skinny <laughs> guy from uh, Scottsdale. He likes Todd pizza. Ellenbecker. He likes pizza. He um, loves pizza. Dude actually, loves pizza. Yeah, I'm I'm familiar with with Masaki from some stuff that we had done with Theraband years and years ago, and he's over oh, okay. in state now. Awesome. Um, and he he's doing a really good job. Uh, he's doing a lot of stuff now. Yeah, he really is. It really is. Um, well, so this study, I'll just, re I, since uh, neither, uh, I think Todd uh, called him, they, do they call uh, Masaki, is this, do they call him Massa, maybe? Massa, oh, maybe that's yeah. his nickname? Yeah, I think you're right. Okay, Todd said something about Massa, couldn't make it. So um, to just give you a, just a quick rundown, since Todd nor Massa could be here, the study uh, was just done to, to study the relationship between the presence of scapular dyskinesis and throwing related injury in collegiate baseball pitchers during each respective course up to four subsequent seasons. They looked at a single division one NCAA team participating in the study over the course of the four years. Scapular dyskinesis test was implemented during the preseason for baseball pitchers. Players were followed throughout each respective season to track the incidence of throwing uh, related injuries. And I'm not gonna read the entire um, results for you, but the conclusions were uh, the results suggest that collegiate baseball pitchers with dominant arm scapular dyskinesis likely are at increased risk of throwing related shoulder injuries. Uh, I didn't so, like that conclusion. Do you say that again? I did not like that conclusion. You didn't like the conclusion mm -hmm. based on the data that was provided. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. it wasn't all, it wasn't consistent, was it? Yeah. Um, when you say likely it increased risk and you know i'm not a big fan of the p-value to begin with uh, when we're looking at these odds ratios the problem that i have uh, is, is the the confidence interval was huge they were really high. um and so to make that conclusion in addition to having a p-value of point well i think it was one six to say they're likely at risk that's just not it what I, this is the thing i don't i didn't like about this study. i liked the 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 concept and the design what I didn't like was, the, which is a lot, and I hate to say this because Todd's a great friend of ours, but we can we can talk like that no, in a constructive can't. way. Yep. Um, what I didn't like is what I'll, it, it's opposite of what Tim did, which is taking if you're going to play this the this, uh, the statistics probability p value game, you got You can't have it both ways, right? Either you're going with statistical significance or you're going with clinical significance. You really can't go both ways. In this case, what they said was because there was a five times risk of having this problem, shoulder problem, if you had dyskinesis, then you're that's where they're making this jump of faith saying, oh, you're most likely at risk. But yet statistically, and when you look at what clinicians need to understand don't read what the authors are saying a lot of times. Go back, look at the data, 
when you see that confidence interval that range from a 0.4, I think it was a 0.48 to a 48, right? It's a huge confidence interval, which means the sample size was way too small. Yeah. Um, it was very underpowered, more than likely. And it happened over four years, and you only had five shoulder injuries. You had 10 el elbow injuries. 36, 36 pitchers. Their end was 36. Yeah. Well, and, and not all of all, those people, not I, all of those played the full four years, right? But I couldn't follow the numbers. I mean, they were reporting all over the place. Um, but I did go back and run the odds ratios and confirm the confidence intervals and all that kind of stuff. But to, to make that statement is where I want clinicians to understand that you don't necessarily, people will say, oh, yeah, they got better because they had an increase, but it wasn't statistically significant. They left off that whole part. Whereas, you know, what Tim had said, it's the exact opposite. It's significant, but it doesn't matter. And this is why tonight is a great kind of antithesis of, of, of the way you studies, report yeah. results. And nothing against this. I think the study was fine. I think it's a great start, but don't start making leaps of faith because you spent four years collecting data and you may not have found what you looked for. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, Todd. No, it's okay. That was that was one of the questions I was going to ask you, you uh, Phil, about just the five injuries, five only reported over the course of those years, just seemed really small. Yeah, you know, and Todd's also a good friend of all of ours, but but I found the article a little bit confusing to me, in that first of all, if over four years you're you're a baseball coach at a collegiate level and only have five injuries, you should keep doing whatever you're doing, yeah. and and really not study it. <laughs> because you're probably on the right track. But yeah, uh, we, I mean, we know that 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 internal rotation of the scapula has been, been proven in cadaveric studies and like he reported in the article that it does increase the, the valgus load uh, on the elbow, which theoretically should lead to the UCL uh, uh, sprains, right? Mm -hmm. But in the study, they had really very little, uh, I think, what was it? Uh, seven of the 10 elbows that were injured didn't have any dyskinesis. So in my mind, I'm thinking, all right, you have this kinetic chain force transfer that occurs at the scapula down through the shoulder and to the elbow. If it's not functioning properly, maybe all the force and the problem is going to stay at the shoulder. And if it is functioning efficiently, are we just then transferring that summation of speed and that force down to the elbow? But then you have to think of the anatomy in my mind. This is what confused me because if they didn't have dyskinesia, then let's assume that they didn't have that internal rotation. They didn't have an inferior uh, uh, prominence. They didn't have the abnormal mechanics. So then why was the arm positioning poor for the valgus load of the elbow should theoretically be less. So it was confusing to me to follow what they were, what, what really they were saying, what, how they reported their statistics and, and their injury rates. Um, but I do think, I agree, Phil, they're probably in the right direction. I think longitudinal studies are what we need, not moments in time. And this starts to address that let's take four years of one team or at least one program and let's study it. And I think that that is a good direction to go. Well, I think another, maybe another even bigger question is, does, does, you know, the, the, all these, <clears throat> all the people they tested were asymptomatic to begin with, right. right. When they initially tested them because they were asymptomatic and they were testing to see if, that was associated with the throwing related injury. So even the people that had a positive scapular dyskinesis test were asymptomatic. So um, does that, it's like, it's like everything else scapular related. And Tim, you, you know this, you, you've been studying this long enough. The more we learn about the scapula, the more we realize we have no idea what the hell we're looking at or talking about. To, to some degree. So does the, does the scapular dyskinesis test, although I love it, it's a great test. I use it all the time. Does it tell me anything in every person that has it? I mean, it's, it's, it's positive in these people that don't even have symptoms or have problems. So it's, is it possible they could, is, it's possible that some people just have scapular dyskinesis and it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with 
upcoming pathology or existing shoulder problems. Is that, am I off course totally, Tim, or is that No, I, I, I think, uh, so when I came back, when I finished my PhD and I started working with Kibler again, Dr. Kibler again, we created the scapular dyskinesis classification and sort of popularized that. And then we came back and we poo-pooed the four system and mm-hmm. uh, McClure and <clears throat> us, two separate studies basically said, you could say yes, no. But in both of our studies, we found that, and same in this study, that like 80%, 76%, depending on who you read, of the people studied have some scapular dyskinesis. And what we wrote and what seems to get missed in the paper we submitted several years ago, it's like overpronation. Yeah. Or tight Achilles. If you're not killing the load, you can have limited dorsiflexion and not have a problem. So scapular dyskinesis, when you're an orthopedic surgeon like Ben Kibler and people come to you because their shoulder hurts and he sees scapular dyskinesis and then he fixes it, he tries to reposition and it changes their pain. Okay, now we got something because we're altering symptoms, right? It's Mm -hmm. like doing distraction on a cervical radiculopathy patient. It is relieving the symptoms and maybe giving us some guidelines for treatment. So so we've been sort of, we still evaluate the scapula. I just got back from NATA. I did a whole talk on it and, and lab, but it's got to be done in the right component. There's limited information. And I appreciate what Todd and, and his colleagues are trying to do. <clears throat> with what is the long-term effect? But hanging our hat on one thing, like scapular dyskinesis, not hip rotation, not shoulder rotation, not trunk rotation. And there's so much that changes over the course of a baseball season. Scapular dyskinesis could be fine one day, bad another day. You're tired, you're fatigued. Did they throw the day before? Did they not throw the day before? Back fine a week later. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's just a lot of factors. It's a, it's a simple question but it's not encompassing all the issues that we probably need to look at prospectively, longitudinally across a baseball season or any other season with, you know, volleyball or swimming or something like that. Yeah, I think with this study, one one thing it does that I thought was uh, positive that if you can kind of glean out of this is that <clears throat> it clearly points to the need that w- when you you do an exam of someone's shoulder, uh, you need to do a full uh, exam, and just like you said, not not key into one thing. You you got to do an entire complete examination and look at all the different tests and all the different problems it could be. Because one one particular test isn't going to give you a clear picture at all uh, of of what they have going on. And and more than and likely, just one... in this instance, it could very easily one the picture of one thing that's positive could actually mislead you from the the actual problem they have. And the number one best predictor of an injury is what happened to him last year yep. or the previous yep. seven years. And, and right. if you don't, if you don't covariate that, yep. I'm talking stats geeky stuff. Sorry. <laughs> Phil likes that. Um, <laughs> but, like that. but, but, but if you don't take into consideration those other logical factors, things we know, right. You've been injured when you were in 14 years old, odds are good that you're going to get hurt again. That might, We did a study very similar to this with like 700 people. We didn't do scapular dyskinesis. We did uh, lower extremity. I do lower extremity research on occasion. Mm -hmm. And the number one best predictor of who's going to get hurt, all these questionnaires we made them fill out, star excursion balance, hot tests, closed kinetic chain, upper extremity, had you gotten hurt? It out, it trumped everything. Had you previously been hurt? Yeah. Previous, previous injuries. Yeah. Yeah. Hard you know, it, it it really, you know, Dr. Kibler and and Tim, you know, you're you should be commended for really diving into this for uh, many many years, and trying to design uh, something for a clinician to <laughs> utilize, and then having the courage, quite honestly, to say, is this meaningful? Back to does this change practice and and looking at it in a systems approach, like you're just talking about you know, it is, is so important and keeping it as simple as possible within that systems approach. And, and every time I, 
every time I talk to students that rotate in through, I, I, you know, I keep telling them that, you know, Albert Einstein, he, he once said, things should be made as simple as possible, but not any simpler. So <laughs> don't do, you know, don't do everything you can think of to, to try to find something. Keep it simple and directed, but hit all the areas in a system system wide fashion. And that's exactly what you're saying. And and you guys, you know, you disproved actually what you thought you were onto years ago. And and that, that's that's very commendable in the literature, let me tell you. Yeah, well, I echo that. Gary, great, great, great comments, man. I, I love that. Um one of the things, uh Tim, back to you on this was what I what they they really downplayed the fact that elbow injuries had nothing to do with scapular dyskinesis. They didn't really. They just kind of like, well, because we didn't see it, it was like one sentence, and that was it. So we're still seeing in in some of the clinics where they're trying to tie back this dyskinesis with elbow problems. What have you guys found with that? Um, looking at the elbow instead of the shoulder. I, I think when the mechanics are bad and everything starts to fall apart, it, it's a component of it that can be addressed. Um, we haven't really done a prospective study. We are much more waiting till somebody gets hurt. Um, our training program that our that Dr. Kibler does and our our baseball guys is very holistic, core, scapula, eccentrics shoulder rotation, shoulder scapular strengthening. So our treatment, our preventative treatment, sort of what, what Gary was talking about is very comprehensive. So we don't just isolate on the scapula. We look at the cuff, we look at the core, we look at the hips, we look at the legs, we do everything. So I, I think you got to take it all into component. I, I don't have any data to say, oh, if you look at increased external or internal rotation, you're going to put greater valgus load if you're asking about that. I, I can't I can't speak to that, but I can tell you our our preventative approach is very inclusive. Thanks, buddy. But I will say the we just got a paper accepted in IJSPT trying to do more what you're talking about, Gary, where we're looking at the core, we're looking at the um, um, hips and we're looking at shoulder mobility in a three minute scan something that we can apply but gets everything we we have a reliability paper accepted or is published at ijspt and so now we're trying to get the validity part it was part of a uh, a doctoral project out of evansville indiana and uh, working with rob butler in st louis and the doctoral student is kyle matzel who's a big proponent of and does a lot of teaching for um, Plitsky and uh, and those guys in FMS. And so we, it's got an FMS twist to it, but it's more <clears throat> shoulder um, focused and he did a really nice job. So hopefully we're going to have, because the problem with measuring 7,000 things is it takes forever, unless right. you have an army of physical therapists or residents down at training camp and it's only a one time. I really, I really think there needs to be something where we can come in every couple of weeks, quick screen. Oh, you're looking. Oh, you look worse. Whoa, what's going on? Has your load gone up? Did you get? Did you break up with your girlfriend? Did something happen in your life that that changes throughout the year? Yeah, you know, if we only had a few things to look at, you know, if I was great. to if I was to have a, a only a couple of things to look at in a baseball pitcher, I would look at ankle mobility uh, for sure. I would absolutely look at the hip and then I would look at the thumbo, uh, the thoraco pelvic cylinder. So how the, how the hips then relate to the shoulder. And those would be the four things that I, that I would really focus on that, that, that we really need. And I, I'm curious to see what your testing battery is because we really need a way to quickly do that uh, for the masses. We have not done a good job of reducing elbow injuries. Uh, we have with shoulder injuries, but um, we have a long way to go, I think. And I think it's gonna be all of that 
the, the true kinetic force development and transitional power that ends up um, ends up coming through the hips and through the scapula. Those are really the two the the two transmission areas that that I see I would focus on. So it's a great nice. great comment. Tim. Yeah, great idea. Great idea. I'd like to see all that too. Uh, volume sixteen. <laughs> little little promotion for little IJSPP. Plug. Volume sixteen. Wait volume a sixteen. Well, we're in seventeen now, so it was. I know. It's, a month you know, ago. It's snuck under you. Yeah. You, know, you can't catch everything. Yeah. I didn't see it. I don't think I did either. 16 issue six, according to my end note that I popped up here. Six. <laughs> I'm going to take a look tomorrow. All right. Yes. Well, does anybody, uh, before we uh, have Ashley have, <laughs> hop back on, does anybody have any further questions before we close? I think we answered all of them, but we're uh, coming in from people. Uh, uh, watching live so thank you guys for the several questions that you sent in and uh, i guess before uh ashley hops back in alan tim thank you for uh both joining us tonight to talk about your study we appreciate you uh, spending your hour with us uh tonight and uh talking about this second study as well we appreciate your time and uh expertise uh, and then of course uh gary Thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure having you on, uh, Gary. Gary is uh, one, of the, one of the guys I just love listening to when he talks. Uh, he's always got like, I mean, his his talks are just always, uh, you know, they're they're clean, they're they're functional, and they're like full of pearls. I mean, not everybody's got like a ton of pearls, but Gary's are just like <laughs> packed. Full of, I mean, he's laughing and he's like going to say, oh, no, that's not making me. a lot of mistakes that. over the years. Yeah, well, things. but he's got them, man. They're great. I love listening to Gary and I uh, love talking to him. But uh, and Gary and I, Gary and I go to a lot of meetings together and we spend a lot of time uh, after the after the meetings over a lot of times, sometimes late at night, just uh, hanging around yep. talking about studies and and all kinds yep. of stuff. So it's great thanks having, having you here, me. Gary. I enjoyed oh, it. Our pleasure. And Phil, uh, as always, man, thanks. Uh, thanks for popping in. Just you, you weren't really that late at all. Partner in crime. I, I just wanted to say, Rob, this this format and Ashley and Mike for doing this and our sponsors to have Tim and Alan here was just so awesome to have the guests of the uh, of the papers, the papers and have yeah. that type of discussion that we have. Mm -hmm. And Gary, I mean, I can't, I can't say better than what Rob did. I just love listening to you, and thanks for being here. Having our guests here, you know, it's just a, a, a wonderful uh, format. So I'm just very happy to be part of this. Thanks for everybody. Yeah. Thanks, guys. All right, Ash. It's all yours. All right. Well, thank you. And from someone who deals with the lower extremity all day long in a hip clinic, I learned some things and appreciated the hip getting some credit in there as well <laughs> um, in that discussion. But thank you, everyone, for joining us. I saw a note asking for handouts. If you're talking about the actual articles, I did put the link to those um, in the chat box. Um, they are all open access articles. If you have questions, concerns, need something, can't find them, my email is also in the chat box. Feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, you guys will all, it should be in less than 10 minutes, should be getting certificates of attendance for CEUs, both BOC and Louisiana and Tennessee, one hour of credit. So thank you for attending. And the recordings will be sent out to you if you want to share with anyone else. Now, recorded ones do not count for CEU. So um, cue your colleagues to jump on live for our next one. We will be sending out the schedule of all of the rest of the year's journal clubs. Um, shortly. I know Mary in our office has been working on that. So that will be coming out and um, we look forward to continuing to grow this. Thank you for everyone for uh, being on here and we'll see you next month. Thanks, Have a good guys. night. Thanks, Thanks, good rest of the week. Thanks, Bye. Thanks Bye. for inviting us. You're welcome.